My uh, presentation today has um, um, a very large title, a very general title, and I can tell you that it's even more general than that. Uh, but the reason why I chose uh, this presentation is that uh, is for, well, I have a few reasons. One is that um, I come from this university which bears the name of Ovid, Ovidius, and uh, it bears the name of Ovidius because um, uh, the, the Latin poet, um, Ovid, Publius Naso, was exiled to the ancient city of Thomas, you may know that, which became today the city of Constanza. Now, another reason is that um, um, Ovid's exile and Ovid's work in general um, have been uh, extremely influ influential on European literature and on British literature in particular. And uh, a third reason is that when he was exiled from Rome to uh, the dark city of Thomas, he didn't go by sea, he didn't travel by sea, he uh, traveled by land. So he may have crossed Albania, who knows. Um, okay, this is uh, um, the, the illustration of uh, the statue of um, uh, Ovidius Publius Naso. He was uh, born in uh, Sulmo in uh, uh, the year 43 BC uh, and he died in Tomis uh, in 17 or 18 AD. Well, people are not sure um, when he exactly died. Now, uh, what happened to him? So he uh, actually uh, wrote um, a number of volumes of poems um, and his influence on the whole European literature and on the British literature um, comes from the fact that he wrote on love and his early works were, his early volume was called Amores. Then he wrote on the art of making love uh, and uh, his work was uh, Ars uh, Amatoria and uh, he also wrote um, on uh, um, probably his, his best known uh, uh, volume of poems is Metamorphosis, which are based on uh, uh, Greek uh, legends, on the Greek mythology, but he also invented some of the metamorphoses. Um, and last, uh, last of all, when uh, he was living in Thomas, and obviously he hated the place because it was very cold, um, he wrote a wonderful poems which are called Tristia, Sorrows. And these poems um, uh, had a, a, a huge influence on the poets which lived during the Renaissance and during uh, the 19th century and uh, who were exiled or who became expats from their own country because of their ideological um, uh, ideas or political uh, beliefs. Um, when he got to Thomas, he, um, as I said, he was very, very unhappy there. And uh, he described, and I'm, I'm, I'm going very briefly on, on the slides, I'm just going to uh, uh, quote a number of lines. So he described the people living in Thomas uh, as a mixed crowd of half-breed Greeks and full-blooded barbarians, chiefly of Tito Dacian origin. They dressed in skins, wore their hair and beard long, and went about armed. They were good horsemen and archers, which was not on his case. He was a bad horseman and a bad archer, and therefore he was not uh, very much appreciated by these macho people in Thomas. But, uh, however, they appreciated his, uh, his culture and his education, and uh, he made him a citizen of honor. Um, and this is the image of a Jito uh, which corresponds to uh, Ovid's description. Well, uh, his capital work is Metamorphosis. As I said, that's a long poem um, in 15 uh, books. And uh, what is interesting about the Metamorphosis is that it starts with the creation of the world. And the creation of the world looks very much like what we read um, at the beginning of Genesis in the Bible, that is, 
And this is the translation of the beginning of, of his metamorphosis into English. Before the ocean was on earth or heaven, nature was all alike, a shapelessness, chaos so called, all rude and hungry matter, till God, or kindlier nature, settled all, all argument and separated heaven from earth, water from land, our air from the high stratosphere, a liberation, so things evolved, and out of blind confusion found each place bound in eternal order. A, a beautiful beginning of metamorphosis, although uh, the rest of the, of the poems uh, contain various stories of how people were metamorphosed into objects, into animals, um, either as a reward or as a punishment. I'm not going to get into details. If you're interested in that, I'm here and I can tell you many stories. Now, uh, just before moving on, I would like to show you this statue, which was um, made by uh, the Italian sculptor uh, Ettore Ferrari in 1887, when um, when Constanza uh, became um, uh, a sister to uh, Sulmo uh, in, in Italy. And uh, uh, if you ever come to Constanza, I will find it in Ovid Square. And also the epitaph, which the poet wrote before he died. He knew he was going to die there. And uh, he thought of writing his epitaph. And uh, it goes like this. I, who like here, sweet Ovid, poet of tender passions, fell victim to my own sharp wit. Passerby, if you've ever been in love, don't grudge me the traditional prayer, may Ovid's bones lie soft. Okay, now, um, I get to the second part of my presentation, which is um, uh, of its legacy in painting. And uh, he became very, very famous uh, during the Renaissance, um, and uh, many um, uh, 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 stories from his metamorphosis were uh, illustrated by uh, painters. Uh, starting with the 15th, 16th centuries up to the 20th century. So his influence actually goes uh, to three directions. One, love poems, because he wrote love poetry. Two, the theme of exile. Um, and, um, and three, um, the, the theme of the, um, the genius who's not understood by his uh, fellow people. Um, these are a few um, illustrations of, uh, of his uh, uh, metamorphoses, for instance, uh, Titian, Diana and Actian, uh, Aces and Galatea, um, a wonderful sculpture by Bernini, Apollo and Daphne, the 17th century, um, a, a beautiful, there are many uh, illustrations, many, many paintings uh, based on of his metamorphoses. This is the one I like uh, uh, best, uh, it's Waterhouse, 1903, Echo and Narcissus. And this is one of the stories I will focus on, is the story of Pyramus and Thisbe, and one of its representations by Waterhouse, 1909. Do you know the story of Pyramus and Thisbe? No. Do you know the story of Romeo and Juliet? Yes. It's the same. <laughs> so Pyramus and Thisbe were two young uh, people uh, who are neighbors and uh, because their parents uh, uh, wouldn't speak to, to one another, they uh, didn't allow their children to uh, meet or to talk to each other. And uh, they were separated by a wall, that's why uh, Thisbe is uh, what has her ears uh, um, stuck to the wall, because in this way she can hear Pyramus on the other side. And uh, they decide to... Um, um, to get married. Uh, therefore, they have to run away. They run away from home, and uh, what happens is similar to um, Romeo and Juliet's story. It's a very sad story. Um, Thisbe arrives uh, at the meeting place first, and there she finds a bear. And the bear had just eaten an animal, so there, are, there is blood dropping from the bear's mouth. Uh, Thisbe is scared, and when she is running away, her scarf falls down, and the bear catches her scarf. Then Pyramus comes and sees the scarf full of blood, and imagines that Thisbe uh, had already been eaten by the bear, so he commits suicide. Thisbe comes back, sees Pyramus dead, and she commits suicide as well. And they are both 
turned into a tree. So that's the metamorphosis. And this is I'm going to show you. Yeah. Well, this is um, how Shakespeare uses the Pyramus and Thisbe myth in uh, Midsummer Night's Dream. But um, although the myth is sad, it's strength, actually. Um, Shakespeare, in, in this play, Shakespeare doesn't look at it uh, in a tragic way. On the contrary, I could say that he uses some kind of postmodern <laughs> approach to, to the myth. Uh, if you read uh, A Midsummer Night's Dream, you'll see that it's not the, the core thing in, 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 the, in the play, on the contrary. Um, and there are a few lines taken from this monologue when she comes and sees Pyramus, then, then, then she stabs herself. But it's tongue in cheek, it's not as serious as the story of Romeo and Juliet is. And it is supposed that Romeo and Juliet, well, the story uh, was also influenced by, uh, uh, by Pyramus and Thisbe's legend. Okay, now. Um, in the Middle Ages, during the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, the troubadour literature um, has um, uh, has been grounded on uh, on uh, of its uh, um, love poems, and um, um, also Dante Dante considers in in his Divine Comedy he considers one of the most influential, most important Latin poets, number four, he says, and uh, he. Um, feels of its exile because he himself uh, was exiled from Florence for political uh, matters. Um, also, um, another theme is Fortuna Labilis, that is the, the fortune that changes uh, um, all the time. And, um, and we find it with Dante and with Giordano Bruno. Um, right, now we move on to um, to three um, and I'm I will not take uh, too much of your time. There are three uh, texts and three writers which I would like to focus on and um, um, who have been influenced by, uh, by Ovid. One is uh, a modernist writer, um, uh, labelled as modernist, uh, James Joyce. And uh, it is known that the portrait of the artist as a young man um, is based on the myth of um, Icarus and uh, Didalus. Do you know the myth of Icarus and Didalus? Yeah, so it's the labyrinth and Didalus want an Icarus. Both the father and son want to flee out of the labyrinth and uh, uh, one uh, manages to get to the shore, the other one does not because he was stupid enough to make himself wings of wax. Um, this is um, a representation of the Minotaur legend, which lies at the basis of the labyrinth story and of uh, Joyce's uh, text. And I'm going to I would like have just a few uh, lines from uh, a portrait of the artist as a young man. The beginning, in which Joyce uses the symbol of the the, the Minotaur. The Minotaur actually is the moon cow, uh, like in a uh, children's story. Once upon a time, and a very good time, it was there was a mukau coming down along the road, and this mukau that was coming down along, along the road met a nice little boy named Baby Taku. That's the beginning of, uh, of the novel, and then the ending when, uh, when Stephen Dedalus, the protagonist, Dedalus he dies, right, the protagonist, um, leaves home, um, and, and he feels like the Dallas. He flies away. He, um, goes on his self-imposed exile because he wants to get free from uh, the, uh, the strings attached to him in the Jesuit school. Um, another very, very beautiful legend uh, which Ovid uses in his Metamorphosis is uh, uh, Lida and the Swan. And this is one of the representations of Lida and the Swan. And I will focus on William Butler Yeats's poem, Lida and the Swan. And see, well, we're going to see how he interprets um, this, uh, this legend. Now, you know the legend of Lida and the Swan, I suppose. Um, Zeus um, turned himself into a swan and raped Lida. And uh, um, out of this um, uh, encounter, um, Lida gave birth of two eggs. 
in one egg, each egg contains two twins, two twins. To, uh, each one contains one pair of twins, and in one egg, um, the, the pair of twins were Helen of Troy and Hercules. So this is uh, uh, Yeats' poem, uh, an absolutely wonderful poem, in which he depicts the exact moment of rape. Um, I'm not going to read it, you may read it, but, uh, because I don't want to take too much of your time, but um, it's a, a, a wonderful poem, not only because it uh, symbolizes um, an, the end of, the, of a civilization, that's what Yeats wants, we want the poem to signify the end of a civilization and the birth of another civilization. There is a, a lot to talk about here the end of a civilization because uh, Helen, the birth of Helen, meant the destruction of Troy, uh, which means the destruction of a whole Trojan world, and this led to the rise of the uh, Latin uh, civilization. But it's uh, wonderfully, it's one of his best actually, and it's wonderfully uh, composed. I will move on to a lighter poem, uh, well, uh, apparently lighter poem, and it's, it's by Derek Mann, um, an Irish poet like uh, the William Butler Yeats, and um, uh, he writes this poem called Ovid in Thomas. And when I first read the poem, I saw that Derek Mann came to Constanza, came to Thomas, uh, went to Constanza and saw the statue and wrote the poem, which is not true. He had an, uh, a, a postcard. He just saw the statue and of its square. He didn't come to Constanza, but his imagination uh, made him write this uh, poem, um, in which of it he uses the theme of exile and he also uses the theme of the poet who is not understood by his uh, uh, fellow people, by here, by the community he lives in. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm just going to read a few lines um, uh, which I think uh, um, express what uh, Derek Mann wanted to, um, to convey. Um, he describes Tomis, uh, well, Constanza of today, as a handsome city, an important port, a popular resort, with an oil pipeline, martini terraces, and even a dignified statue of me. So the poem actually is in Ovid's voice. Ovid is in another world now and he looks upon his statue and upon the present day um, Thomas and he muses on his life and what, on what had happened there. A dignified statue of me, right there with, with the terrace, gazing out to sea from the promenade. But for the moment it is merely a place where I have to be. Six years now since my relegation to this town by the late Augustus. Um, and um, he starts meditating. He remembers how he was, he had been uh, um, exiled by Augustus. And the reason, I didn't tell you the reason why he was exiled by Augustus. He says that the reason was a poem and a mistake. He wrote Ars Amatoria, uh, in which he celebrated extramarital sex. And it seems that one of uh, Augustus's, uh, um, either his daughter or his granddaughter, took that for granted and, um, and experienced it. And Augustus became very, very, <laughs> very cross, and he uh, uh, thought that uh, Ovid should be relegated, should be exiled. Anyway, so he muses on on his exile, and then he says, "Well, um, I I cannot see, I cannot find my muse." Because this is this is what Ovid also said. I cannot write anymore. I'm here among these barbarians. I cannot write here. They cannot speak my language. I have to learn their language. I I don't have um, my muse left me, says Ovid, and and Derek Mann says the same. The muse is somewhere else, not here, by this frozen lake, or if here, there, then I'm sorry about the mistake. Then I'm not poet enough to make the connection. Are we truly alone with our physics and myths, the stars no more than glittering dust, with no one there to hear our choral odes? And then the end of the poem, I incline my head to its candor and weep for our exile. And by our exile, he means anyone who feels exiled because of his 
political beliefs because he's misunderstood by the community. Because uh, he has to be to go on, on an exile for, for um, I don't know, um, economical reasons or any other kind of reasons. So um, uh, my point was to take you on this journey. It's the physical journey um, and the intellectual and the cultural journey of, uh, of it, a very short journey today, but a journey which led to so many influences. A journey which uh, we can, we may also have in our lives, if by any reasons we need to leave our country. I hope we won't have to do that. Thank you.